Well, hello, everybody. This is Lon Solomon, and I would love for you to join me this year for our Holy Land tour leaving October 2022 on the 24th, and uh, also for you to consider being part of our Footsteps of Moses tour all through Egypt, the pyramids, the Sphinx, Abu Simbel, uh, Aswan, King Tut's tomb, King Tut's treasures, Nile cruise, all of that in February of 2023. The Holy Land brochure is posted on our website. We still have a few spaces, so get on board before we fill up. Uh, and uh, the uh, brochure for our Egypt trip will be up by the end of July, Lord willing. So if you have any questions, give me a call, 703-280-1114, 703-280-1114. I want you to go to the Holy Land and to Egypt with me. So give it some prayerful consideration. God bless. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Live with Lon. We are so glad that you're with us this week. And we have a, a really interesting passage this week. Uh, that gives us a deep insight into the ways of God. So, let's pray, and we're going to get right to it. Here we go. Dear Lord Jesus, we pray the Holy Spirit would open our hearts and our minds so that we might be able to comprehend the deep things of God. And, uh, Lord, uh, uh, teach us today and encourage our faith and Use your word uh, in our lives today in a mighty way. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, what? Amen. And what? Amen. Yes, you got it. Now, what do we study here at Live with Lon? Tell me, tell me what we study. Say with me. The Bible. Come on. The whole Bible. Nothing but the Bible. And then we apply to our lives, right? Yes, right. Now, today, uh, we have what I prayed in my prayer, uh, the one of the deep things of God. And that grows out of a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, verse 10. Listen, but God has revealed these things to us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. And so... Uh, this is one of those deep things of God. So, uh, without further ado, we're in John chapter 7, working our way up to John 12, where we'll join the other three Gospels with John's Gospel for the triumphal entry and the last week of Jesus' earthly life. So, I'm going to go ahead and read uh, the whole rest of the chapter because I want you to feel it. Uh, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about uh, what I mean uh, by the deep things of God. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Uh, remember, Jesus has gone up to the Feast of Tabernacles uh, in Jerusalem. After his brothers challenged him, he came up and then he did a healing. Uh, met Last week, I told you that, it, it, that healing's not recorded in the Bible, uh, but the Pharisees got mad at him because he'd healed on the Sabbath. And he said to them, look, if a man receives circumcision, verse 23, on the Sabbath, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I have made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. All right, now that's where we've been. And let's pick up now at verse 25. And of course, we're using uh, the New King James version of the Bible. Then some of them from Jerusalem said, is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Messiah, the Christ? However, we know where this man is from. But when the Christ comes, no one knows where he's from. 
uh, when they say we speak, we know where he's from, they're talking about from Galilee, of course. Then Jesus cried out in the temple as he taught, uh, saying, you both know me and you know where I am from. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know, but I know him, for I am from him and he has sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no one laid hands on him because his hour had not yet come. And many of the people believed in him and said, when the Messiah comes, will he do more signs, more miracles uh, than these which this man has done? And the Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, Jesus. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you for a little while, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Then the Jews said among themselves, Where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? Uh, what is this thing that he said? You will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. And on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit, whom those who believe in him would receive for the holy spirit was not yet given because jesus was not yet glorified verse 40 therefore many from the crowd when they heard this saying said truly this is the prophet from deuteronomy 18 others said this is the messiah but some said will the messiah come out of galilee has not the scripture said that the messiah comes from the seed of david and from the town of Bethlehem, where David was. So there was a division among the people because of him. And some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Verse 45. Then the officers uh, uh, came to the chief priests and the Pharisees, who said to them, Why have you not brought him? And the officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. And Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus by night, John chapter 3, being one of them, one of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council, and a Pharisee said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him? and knows what he is doing, let's give the man a, a fair chance. Then they answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet arises out of Galilee. Okay, now, what's going on here? Well, of course, the rabbis want to take Jesus. They sent the uh, as you read in verse 45, they sent the officers uh, to arrest him. And, uh, and the people are ambivalent about Jesus. And look at the thing that's hanging so many of them up. It's the fact that he's from Galilee. Watch. Verse 27, they said, however, we know where this man is from. But when the Christ comes, the Messiah comes, no one knows where he is from. We, we know he's from uh, Galilee, uh, but, but that's not totally true. The Bible was very clear about where the Messiah was coming from. Let, let me take a break and show you this. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. The Bible's very clear 
that the Messiah was coming out of Bethlehem. And, and we see this a little bit later on. Uh, look, look with me at verse 40. Therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, truly, this is the prophet, Deuteronomy 18, God shall send you a prophet. Everyone believed that to be a messianic reference, which it is. Others said, verse 41, this is the Messiah. But some said, will the Messiah come out of Galilee? Look, verse 42, has not the scripture said that the Messiah comes from the seed of David, look, and from the town of Bethlehem, where David was. So there was a division among the people. What was hanging them up? Well, the fact that Jesus was from Galilee. And even the Pharisees, look, uh, verse 52, they say to Nicodemus, the man who came to Jesus by night in John chapter 3, they answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet arises out of Galilee. This was really a huge hang-up, both for the people and for the religious leaders. Now, one more quick thing before we go to so what. Just notice, if you would, this is just for making sure our exposition is complete, Look, if you would, that Jesus said, verse 34, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. And the Jews said, does he intend, verse 35, to go to the diaspora, the dispersion among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? Because he said, where I am you can't come. We know what he meant. He meant he was going back to heaven and they couldn't come. Uh, but, uh, but they didn't know that. And so they think, well, maybe he, uh, the Jews had been dispersed after the Babylonian captivity to many places uh, around the globe. And so uh, this was called by the Jews the diaspora or the dispersion. And so they said, well, maybe he's going to uh, uh, these places where the Jewish people have been spread all around, and therefore we can't go with him. Uh, but we know what it is, right? Where was he going? He's going, he was ascending back into heaven. Okay, now that's our passage. And we're going to come back and talk about the living water that Jesus talked about. But today we want to now ask our question. What's our question? Come on, say it with me. One, two, three. So what? That's right. And uh, hey, not a sermon, just a thought, baby. Uh, that's what we're going to give you now, is we're going to give you that thought, uh, that application uh, to your life and my life. And as Jackie said, wait a minute, I've got to find him here. Where's my friend Jackie? Here he is. As Jackie said, how sweet it is to be teaching the Word of God like this. Now, there's a very interesting verse in Psalm 103. Let me show it to you. Verse 7 of Psalm 103, it says, And he, that is God, made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. Okay, now what that verse is telling us is that Moses got to see God's ways. Uh, the children of Israel, in their stubbornness and their hard-heartedness, got to see his acts, his his miracles, water from the rock, manna from heaven, etc., etc., opening the Red Sea. Moses got to see his ways, or to put it uh, in other terms, they saw what God did. Moses uh, was allowed to understand why God did what he did. We have that? Now, today, here in John chapter 7, God is going to show us something about his ways. And what is that? Well, let's summarize what we said a moment ago. What was the big deal hanging up all of these people that were discussing whether Jesus was the Messiah? Well, I'm sure there were a number of items, but a big one was he's not from Bethlehem. He's from Galilee. And according to the Old Testament prophet Micah, the Messiah's coming from 
Bethlehem. Remember, we read that. The people knew that. You say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus was from Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem. Right. You know that, and I know that, uh, but they didn't know that. Because, remember, when Jesus was a small child, he was commanded, uh, Joseph, his dad, was commanded to take him and to Egypt to escape Herod the Great, who was trying to kill him uh, because uh, he was uh, afraid uh, that the Messiah was going to replace him as king. And so Herod the Great was, was a, a horrible guy, and he would have found Jesus, and he would have killed him. But then when they came back from Egypt, Hosea 11, verse 1, out of Egypt I have called my son. They didn't go back to Bethlehem because originally they were from Galilee. So they went back up to Galilee and uh, they lived up there uh, around uh, Nazareth in Galilee. So as far as these people knew, uh, the first time they met Jesus and his brothers and everybody, uh, they were all from Galilee. They didn't know about him being born in Bethlehem. Now, that is significant that God orchestrated it this way. Why? Because of God's ways. You say, what do you mean? Well, God's ways are multifaceted. But in this regard, one of his ways is that coming to Christ, believing in Christ, and even in God, but certainly in Christ, must be an act of faith. It cannot be an act of sight. It cannot be because the facts are so overwhelmingly conclusive uh, that you don't need to show any faith. It's just, you know, two plus two is four, and because of all that has been revealed to us by God about Jesus, he's obviously the Messiah. <clears throat> no, God does not do that. There's got to be faith mixed in. Faith is a willingness to trust Jesus, even though we, we, it may not all be clearly spelled out, but we're willing to trust him anyway. Now, listen to the Bible say this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. And uh, look, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, which is an amazing commentary on, on the fact that God uh, it demands that it be by faith. Look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. What's God mean? God means that you're not, he's going to make sure nobody can come to Christ based on the wisdom of man, uh, based on the on the human uh, logic and, and, and findings and discoveries of man. Uh, look, look farther down, if you would, verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world by its wisdom did not know God, it pleased God that by the foolishness of the message preached, the gospel, to save those who believe. Now, look down at chapter 2, verse 14 which says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Uh, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. It has to be the Holy Spirit revealing to us who Jesus is, and then we respond by faith. But God says, I'm not going to give the human race all the information that they need to make it absolutely, totally obvious Jesus is the Messiah so that it demands no faith. God's not going to do that. 
You say, well, well what is exactly does that mean? Well, it means, think about it now, it means that God has set up the universe so that man's wisdom cannot prove Jesus is the Messiah, cannot discover that Jesus is the Messiah with human logic and information. Do you understand me? For example, we look at the universe through the telescopes that we have. And it looks like it's light years between planets and light years between galaxies uh, and, and that the universe is billions and billions of years old. Why did God make it look like that? The universe isn't billions and billions of years old. It's maybe 10,000 years old. I don't know, give or take. But it's not billions of years so why didn't God make the universe clearly look like that? So people could say, oh, okay, the Bible's right about creation. No, creation, believing in creation demands faith, that we believe the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, faith is the evidence of things not seen. We, we can't see from the universe, from the telescopes, that the Bible's right. We just have to trust the word of God. That's faith. Uh, or how about the fossil record? All of these fossils uh, that people date to uh, millions and millions of years old. They're not millions and millions of years old. Uh, it's very possible that in the flood, when their bones were soaked in radioactive water coming from the magma uh, under the earth, which is where most of the water came from, check it out in, in Genesis chapter uh, 6 and 7, the uh, the, the crust of the earth was broken open. Uh, and that may be what has skewed uh, the carbon dating, possibly. Anyway, you, you can't look at the fossil record and discover that Jesus is God and the Bible is true. Why didn't God make it so you could? Because then it wouldn't demand any faith to, to believe in Jesus. Or, or how about uh, the logic of evolution, where... Everybody thinks Darwin makes so much sense. Doesn't make sense. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, but uh, because it makes sense to human logic, uh, people follow it instead of showing faith in the Bible. To be honest with you, it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in the Bible. Uh, but these people are drawn away by their human logic. Uh, and that's what 1 Corinthians 1 says. Uh, that uh, the, the, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them. They're going to trust their human logic instead. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14, look at it again. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Here in the Bible, for example, for they are foolishness to him. Okay, and uh, we could go on and talk uh, uh, more uh, about how God has structured things in the natural creation so that if you refuse to show faith in the Lord Jesus, you can be easily uh, duped and misled uh, by the way things look, uh, but it takes childlike faith in the word of God to get saved. And I think of Carl Sagan, some of us remember him, the great uh, astronomer on television who used to talk about the universe being billions and billions, is how he would say it, of years old. He died and refused to come to Christ. Absolutely not, he said. Well, uh, that's tragic. But God has made the world so without faith, we cannot be saved and come to Christ. It has to be childlike faith, not childish faith, not silly, stupid faith, but childlike. Childlike faith is our father or mother tell us something, and as a little child, we just believe them. We don't try to figure it all out, and we don't notice all the objections and all of the obstacles. We just believe them. That's what children do. This is how God wants us to be when he tells us the truths of the Bible. We just believe them. As I love to say, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. Do you understand? Now, this is one of the ways of God where he will not react. He will not allow 
anyone to come to Christ and be saved unless they're willing to show this kind of childlike faith in him. Regardless of what astronomy says, regardless of what uh, the fossil record says, or at least the, what they believe it says, regardless of whether or not the ark can be found. You know, why hasn't the ark been found uh, up on Mount Ararat? I don't believe God's going to let an ark be found up there because suddenly uh, that would be human reasoning uh, convincing people that the Bible was true. I, I don't think God's going to let it be found. You say, but wait a minute. In archaeology, the more they dig out of the ground, the more the Bible proves to be right. You're correct. It's true. There are clues uh, from archaeology. There are clues from the, the archaeological record and our archaeological artifacts. But there are still people who interpret these clues uh, to contradict the Bible, or at least not to confirm the Bible. So God does give us clues, but it's still got to be by faith, friends. That's the only way God operates with man, on one system only, faith. And God, let's go a little farther, even... And I, and I know this may upset some of you. It's almost like God set up the universe and the light years and the fossil record and, and, and Darwin almost like to uh, deceive people into thinking that there's no God in the Bible's wrong. I just think if you're determined you're not going to show faith, God has set it up uh, so that you can easily be drawn away uh, by uh, the way things look. I'm just taking a stab at it here, but this has always intrigued me, that he set the universe up so that it almost misleads those who don't want to show faith. Now, am I saying that we should ignore science and archaeology? No. But I'm saying when it contradicts the Bible, it's wrong. If people use it to contradict what the scripture says, they've got it wrong. And it's almost like the Lord <laughs> led them that way because they refused to show faith. Now, let's close by asking the question, why does, did God do this this way? Why is faith so important to him? Well, it's very simple. Let me read it to you, the answer to that question. From, let me read it, the answer to that question to you from a couple of scripture verses. Uh, look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, the humanly wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are mighty in the world's sight. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. Watch, that no flesh should glory in his presence. It is written, verse 31, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. How about Ephesians, uh, verses two, uh, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9? Many of us know these verses by heart, uh, but look what it says here. It says, Ephesians 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. God says, I've made salvation a gift that is activated by faith, not by any kind of works, so that no one boasts before God. Uh, 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 let's look, if you would, with me at Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified, was saved by works, he has something of which to boast but not before God. I mean, he doesn't have it. Uh, uh, if you get saved by works, you can boast and say, look what I did, God. Look what I did, God. God says, no, no, no. Uh, that's not happening. Uh, uh, look, 
verse 27 of Romans chapter 3, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? The law of works? No, but by the law of faith. And finally, verse 16 of Romans 4, look at this. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. Hey, Isaiah 42, verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not share with another. When we get to heaven, all the glory goes to God for saving us. Not one millionth of one percent goes to you or me for our salvation. It's all by grace. It's all by the gift of God through faith. And none of it is because of us. There will be no boasting except, what did the Lord say? Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's why God set it up by faith. So you can't take any credit. I can't take any credit. Nobody can take any credit. The credit and the glory and the boasting all belongs to God. So let me close by reading to you 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. The reason God set it up this way is so that our faith should not be in the wisdom of men. If, if the universe, it all made sense to, and fit with six-day creation, if, if the, the fossil record all made sense and fit within 10,000 years, if evolution was clearly disproved and all of that by the wisdom of man was done, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men. Look, according to the wisdom of men uh, and how they interpret the universe, the fossil record, all this stuff, we would never believe in God. But look, our faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So folks, to conclude, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that the glory of the gospel of Christ should not shine through to them. And the reason he's been able to do that, at least in part, is because God set up the universe to allow him to deceive men and to blind men to the gospel if they really don't want to come by way of faith. So that's as much as I understand this. You say, well, wow, that's pretty amazing. Uh, that the Lord's done that. Folks, I'm not trying to justify what God did. Believe me, God doesn't need you or me to be happy or, 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 or that it makes sense to us what he's done. I'm just telling you, that's why the light years are the way they are. That's why the fossil record, that's why uh, the ark hasn't been found. That's why uh, uh, the, the evolution came into being with Darwin and all these other things. That's why. Because if you don't want to come by faith, God has set the universe up so that you can be deceived by it with the working of the enemy. Interesting. Hey, praise God. Praise God. You allowed Jesus to break through all that, and you were willing to come to him by simple childlike faith. Praise God that I, a scientist, a chemistry major, uh, was allowed, uh, God broke through that, but the, with the power of his spirit, he shined in my heart, 2 Corinthians 4, uh, that the glory of the gospel might be seen by me, too. And uh, listen, I remember I was having uh, an appointment with my daughter Jill, with her wonderful doctor that she had for many, many years here at Children's Hospital in in D.C. He's now moved on uh, to uh, a different uh, university where he uh, a quite, has a quite a prestigious uh, chair uh, now uh, in his medical practice. But we were sitting there talking, and I said to him, Doc, I said, you know what? He was Jewish. I said, having gone to medical school, I don't see that there's any way in the world why somebody doesn't believe in the Bible and in Christ and in God. And he's like, why would you say that? And I'm like, Doc, 
And after you see the amazing complexity of the human body, the endocrine system, the reproductive system, the digestive system, the nervous system, uh, all of the systems uh, th that are uh, amazing. Uh, the, you, you, I, I mean, I don't see how anybody who's a doctor can believe that that just happened, that there's not a creator God who wrote the Bible and is telling us about it. And he said, you know, when I went to, I, he said, I never really thought about that. I, I was a little amazed. And I said, well, you know what, my friend, you need to. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm not 100% sure all of the ins and outs of, of how you've made the universe so that it can be used for people who don't want to come to you by faith. It can be used to deceive them by the enemy. But Lord, those are your ways, and I certainly am not going to argue with them. Just like all of these people here were deceived because they didn't think Jesus, you made it look like Jesus didn't come from Bethlehem. You made it look like to them that he came from Galilee, and, and that the enemy used that to deceive them. Lord, these are your ways, and I just simply accept them, and I just am glad you let me and so many of the rest of us uh, come uh, by childlike faith. So, Lord Jesus, encourage our faith if we know you. And, Lord, if there are people listening to me who don't know you, I pray that you would really use this today uh, to shock them uh, out of uh, the blindness that the enemy is causing in their life with evolution and astronomy and, 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 and fossils and all this other stuff. And Lord, that they would instead be willing to come to you in childlike faith and just accept what you say in the Bible is true. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Hey, God bless you guys. And Lord willing, we'll see you next week.